and welcome back to the Cover 3 podcast here on CBS Sports. That's Tom Fernelli. That's Barton Simmons. We're, we're going, hey, before midnight Eastern time, but the week is not in the books quite yet. Cincinnati currently holding a 28 to 10 lead. Uh, BYU up 28 to 7 over Texas State. We've got that sweet, sweet Mountain West evening game rocking and rolling on CBS Sports Network. Uh, a reminder, you can always watch the CBS Sports Network action on the CBS Sports app, uh, on the OTT device, mobile, wherever you get it. Um, you know, just log in through your cable provider and you'll be ready to go. Got a lot to get into. Obviously, the first weekend of Big Ten action, a phenomenal finish, maybe controversial. We'll get into it uh, in terms of Indiana taking down Penn State in overtime. Uh, we get to see a nearly perfect, and I would argue perfect, debut for Justin Fields and Ohio State, though the offense maybe not perfect. Uh, Michigan with a statement win, uh, but, I mean, the very first most significant Big Ten result of the 2020 season is the Rutgers Scarlet Knights getting that over win total here. Tom, you said it was either going to be the first game or the last game. It was either going to be Michigan State or it was going to be Maryland. And yes, of course, there was concern as we looked at the depth chart and we saw that familiar name, Art Sitkowski, listed as the or. But and look, Thank God, we got the or. Yeah, we got the <laughs> or in this. It was no of a draw. The transfer from Nebraska, uh, who ended up uh, being the, the starter right there. But like more points scored from Rutgers and Big Ten play than we'd seen in years. Uh, we we have so much to get to here, but I at least wanted to get out here at the beginning because we spent too much time. We had money line sprinkles on Rutgers, like it, it was in the noon slate. Feel, feels very relevant right now as we sit here recording this uh, very important instant reaction pod. I think it's relevant in that of the three people on this pod right now, two of us were Rutgers believers. And then there was a third member who was, you know, got, got all condescending and talked down to us thinking we were fools for believing that Rutgers could win a game. Who was that again, Chip? I can't remember who it was. Oh, that's right. It's Barton. Yeah. The guy whose overs went to zero and two this week. So not only was he wrong about Rutgers, but he led his over army into a losing battle and now half the army's dead. I'm happy. I listen, I, I, there's no ill will in my heart. I'm, pl- I'm happy for the Rutgers Scarlet Knights. I'm happy for you guys that you got your win. Uh, I, look, I also acknowledge that if it was going to happen, it would it better happen this week. So you guys got it in because it was going to be a long year, I think. <laughs> you had, and just to be clear, like this is it, it, you know, 3.9 yards of play by the Rutgers Scarlet Knights, like not exactly the most dominating performance. Dominant. I think Michigan State caught a little bit of the old Rutgers, you know, like they, 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 they uh, like Rocky Lombardi. Um, I don't know, like he's, he's, he, I think that this could be a long year for Michigan State. But look, I'm, I'm not going to try to uh, talk my way out of this one. It was a, it was a good win by the by Rutgers. I, I, I do think that they're in good hands with Greg Schiano. I did think it would take him a little more time to get a W, but uh, I was wrong. You guys were right. I will take my medicine. Go Knights. What do they say? Like, what's their cheer? Go I, Knights. I don't know. Go, Go Rutgers. They probably just fist pump a lot and do yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah. I don't know. I, you know, I have to, I can't talk too much crap because honestly, without Rutgers, the money line sprinkle, I had a losing week. So they saved me from having a bad week in the locks. But yeah. That was a nice was, money line sprinkle, though. That, that's a, what was that? What was the, um, 400. Number on that? Ooh, 400. So yeah, it's, it's the only reason I cross the money line speakers this year. I know. I think I'm just going to start locking up money lines and screw everything else because the process is broken in hell <laughs> for everything else going on. But yeah. So, I mean, yeah, it helps Rutgers that, you know, Michigan state turned the ball over seven times. And it's funny because my one, like the one reason I was so down on Michigan state and like I had toyed when we did our big 10 expert picks before the year I was toying with the idea of putting Michigan State last in the east and the reason I was doing that was because that was just the level of faith I had in Rocky Lombardi and Lombardi overall did not have a bad game at all he completed 31 of 44 passes had 319 yards he had three touchdowns he also had two really bad interceptions and a fumble but 
like Lombardi wasn't really the biggest problem that the Spartans had in this game. So maybe I, I owe him a little more credit than I was giving him. But yeah, it was it was a very ugly football game, but it was one that ended up with a money line sprinkle cashing. So it was beautiful to me. So the um, that theme of like the hidden yards does extend in the Big Ten because Penn State significantly outgained Indiana, like outrushed Indiana. The box score tells a tale that should be a Penn State victory. And so before we even get to Michael Penix reaching out with that like heroic, put it in the Louvre, like like there are going to be so many. I saw, I mean, I, I apologize. I can't credit this one, but somebody said there are going to be so many man caves in Bloomington <laughs> that include some sort of oversized print that gets delivered for Christmas this year. Uh, of that touchdown because right, it was the right first next to the picture of Calbert Cheney. <laughs> I mean, I mean, right. Like, like right next to a Bobby Knight, like right next to uh, the, the, whatever your iconic Indiana moments are. Maybe it's Christian Watford burying Kentucky during that one regular season basketball game. Congratulations. It's Tom or Green's sweet. Tom Green bears. cutting down the net after they <laughs> lose at home, but still won the regular season title. Like it was for so many reasons, affirming for Tom Allen and big picture, a great moment for that program. But within the context of that game, I'm not coming out with a lot of, I don't, I'm not coming out with a lot of panic necessarily for Penn state. Like Sean Clifford is a limiting factor, but I think I viewed Sean Clifford as a limiting factor. But again, the box score is sobering here when you just look at the way this game was played and I, I don't know, man. I'm I'm having trouble trying to figure out. Like, I know I'm going to pick Ohio State. And we can get to the Buckeyes in a little bit. I'm picking Ohio State to win next week, without a doubt. But at the same time, when I'm thinking about Penn State in the general pecking order of the Big Ten West, I mean Big Ten East, like I I think that they're probably still not going to fall below third in terms of the way I view the division, even though the head to head victory goes to the Hoosiers. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, like, yeah, you, you mentioned the box or. Penn State had 488 yards. Indiana had 211, and it knocked off a top 10 team. Uh, but yeah, Penn State had 10 penalties for 100 yards. It had three turnovers. It had some very questionable decision making by James Franklin late in the fourth quarter. It was just. I love that song. You know, I haven't heard that song at a concert in a long time, <laughs> but man, it had been a while. James, been a while. <laughs> James reached in the bag and pulled out some of the old, like the first album stuff today with that. It was just, yeah, it's like, I don't know because I, I, I feel, I understand what you're saying, Chip, but I don't know if I'm not worried about Penn state being any worse than the third best team in the East. And again, we don't want to make like, overarching statements on the big 10 after one week but it's not yes, so much we yes we do <laughs> it's not so much to me that like nah penn state's going to be fine as much as my biggest impression this weekend for at least the first week was that the east kind of stinks like michigan looked good in its win over minnesota ohio state looked good penn state looked okay at times but it also let indiana beat it and it's hard to say indiana looked great in the win and then obviously Rutgers beat Michigan State. Michigan State looks terrible. Maryland looked terrible against Northwestern. So I feel like, yeah, Penn State can't finish any worse than third, but that's probably by default. I, I disagree. I, I think that because, look, Ohio State we still think is good. Like, Ohio State was – we'll talk about Ohio State, but they they checked out. All we have uh, are nitpicks. Like, the only thing we've yeah. got about the Buckeyes right, is like right. very, very, like, fine-tooth comb type stuff. Right. And then we we all thought Michigan State would be bad. Um, Rutgers, we, like you guys thought they would win a game, uh, and that's it. Right. Like, uh, and, and so I, I, and, and I, and I think you guys did too, thought that like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna ding Penn state for losing to an Indiana team that I've been like touting as good. I've been touting them as, as a pretty good team. And so they did lose it and they lost a game that they outgained about 270 yards or whatever it was. And, and I think they had. Before that last drive for uh, for Indiana, let me just see if I can pull it up. Like, how long was that last drive where they scored on? It was uh, 75 yards. Yeah. So, and they they finished with 210. So, like, before that drive, what's where they had like 130 yards of offense before that last drive. So the defense is is awesome. Um, you know, like the the offense isn't 
necessarily like there's there's uh, what this is this, this is Kirk Soraka. like this is what he does he's he keeps it simple he gets his playmakers the ball and you don't come away with any flash and 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 shine necessarily but at the end of the day you know Pat Fryermuth had 10 targets you know their running backs rushed for 250 yards or something uh, or their, their the team did um and I, I think that a lot of a lot of things checked out with Penn State with the exception of and this is the thing we've always been worried about the exception of Sean Clifford and Sean Clifford even though he had some moments especially with his legs the athleticism I you had to hope for Penn State this year to see Sean Clifford reach this next level he if anything that that was a regression week because of some of the mistakes he made and some of the holes he put Penn State into um, so I, I, I still think that if you thought Penn state had a chance to compete with Ohio state before this week, I don't necessarily think your opinion should change. If you thought they weren't on their, they were no work on the same stratosphere as Ohio state before this week. Well, obviously that's not going to change either. Well, how much of that also is paired with your observation of Ohio state? Yeah, not I think much. Ohio state, I think Ohio state is, is basically what we thought, right? Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, the, the weird thing about the the Penn State loss to me was like she, you, you were talking about Clifford there. I feel like he played too well to pin the loss on him, but I also feel like had they had a better quarterback, they're never in the situation to lose that game too. It's a weird kind of like in between with him that it was. I just feel like if they if they had a higher level QB, they're never in a situation where they need that at the end of the game to beat this Indiana team. Not the way Indiana was playing today, because Indiana it made the plays at the end of the game when it had to. It, it led most of the game, but Indiana didn't play well. I don't think anybody's going to sit there and feel like, oh, Indiana dominated that game and got you know the win they deserved. It was like, who they kind of got away with one there kind of pulled it out crazily at the end so yeah it's it's a weird situation I don't think it damns Penn State for the rest of the season they could still finish in second they could finish in third they might even beat Ohio State next week because frankly in the first half Ohio State did show a little bit of weakness especially with running quarterbacks and that is the one thing Sean Clifford showed us he could do today was he can run the ball so maybe they can give Ohio State some problems next week I'll say this early hunt I don't know what the line's going to be but my early inclination would be to play the play, take the points and play Penn State. Need to see what it is first. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like if it's like seven or something, then I'm that's 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 a little. But I mean, if, if it's, it's if it's Justin 17. Fields was freaking awesome. <laughs> like his only incompletion was a drop. Yes, in the end zone, twenty for twenty one. And if that one was pulled in, it is a perfect passer rating. Like it is. 300 yards and what three touchdowns and 22 for or 21 for 21 or 22 for 22, whatever it was. And until they were doing the, the clock churning at the end of the game, the, he was going to be the team's leading rusher. Now that's where my complaint comes in is because I don't think that the combination of uh, Trey sermon master Teague, and then we saw steel chambers come in there in the second half. Didn't think they were running the ball particularly well, like their best, Running is Justin Fields, design run, Justin Fields, play breaks down, takes off, or just short passing game and just get the ball to Chris Olave, get the ball to Garrett Wilson. And that's fine. Like it's modern college offense, right? You know, if you've if you don't have that, if if Ohio State needs to be Oklahoma, then hey, you can still go make the college football playoff. Like we can when we're looking at the Big Ten right now, I just think Justin Fields checked every single box I wanted to see for somebody who's going to be one of the most dominant players in all the college football. My only nitpick of Justin Fields today was, you know, you look at the final numbers, you mentioned him. He's 20, 21, 276 yards, two touchdowns. He rushed for 54 yards and a touchdown. But if I'm like Chris Olave or maybe some of his other receivers, I'm having a long, hard look at him in the locker room after the game. And I'm saying, bro, stop throwing me into the safety <laughs> that's because the Ohio state offense though right i know but justin <laughs> was trying to get some dudes killed out there today he was he's like no 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 don't make that throw if that's there i understand that you've got the arm to make it but maybe that's not the throw to be making because his receivers were taking some hits and that was the most amazing part about the fact that there was the only one drop because they were pulling it in despite getting leveled time and time again 
So uh, the, what have we been talking about? We've been talking about how, I mean, I agree with all you're saying, Chip, and that that's a concern, but the key to being a juggernaut right now is the wide receiver position. It's one of the, one of the critical factors. Um, and their wide receivers are awesome. Garrett yeah. Wilson and Chris Olave are fantastic. And we just got a, just a taste of Jackson Smith Jigba mm -hmm. with oh his my gosh. You know, five yards that. receiving, <laughs> but the, but one of those, one of those, that, was that the one catch. Impressive is, five yards a dude's going to have in a while. <laughs> yeah, it was ridiculous. Um, Julian Fleming is going to continue to get in there and, and, and get his feet wet as well. Um, you know, that, that, that group's only going to get better. If they stay healthy, that's as, you know, Wilson Olave is as good a duo as there is. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's really encouraging. Um, and, and yet I, I did also come away with some encouragement about Nebraska too. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, you know, they, they kind of had a decent game competed for a little bit. Um, I think that's one of those you can come away with both, uh, feeling good, but, um, I did find it sort of, uh, a very like backhanded sort of dick nice guy move when Ryan Day was was like after the game, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna apologize to Scott Frost and give him a call and let him know that I'm sorry for scoring that last touchdown and running up the score. We had a young guy in there and and and, and weren't able to get that communicated well enough. Like, you know what, man, maybe just don't say anything at the press conference yeah. and just shoot me a text you don't have to start bragging about how you're running the score on me. Like <laughs> I, I, if I'm, if I'm Scott Frost, I'm like, listen, thanks for the pat on the back chief, but I'm good. Was well, so yeah, I not complaining that. in the cover three group chat, but that is two big 10 windows where the total gets busted in garbage time. So if you've got 51 and a half, that thing went kaput with Wisconsin's garbage time score, which got the total to 52 lose by a hook. And if you had 68 and a half, then that thing went kaput with that garbage time touchdown by Ohio State. So here we are, the Big Ten, where the unders are supposed to thrive and flourish like the harvest. And you're losing on garbage time scores from Wisconsin and Ohio State in runaway victories. I I was I was so lost and like <laughs> In my feels about it, I was ready to swear off Big Ten locks for the rest of the season. I was ready to deny any Big Ten plays for the entire rest of the season. Thank goodness Northwestern Maryland came through for me. And Just even that was a little risky with the way Northwestern <laughs> scored. Say, Northwestern's dropping half a hundred. Like, say, screw Scott Frost. When is Ryan Day going to call me to apologize for that touchdown? <laughs> I mean, brutal. Like, like, I, like a half a hook with... Wisconsin and a half a hook with Ohio State, both garbage time scores when he could have just kneeled it out. Hmm. What happened to the league I used to know? Nobody kneels it. Not even not even Devin Ford for Penn State when they're supposed to kneel it. You know? No UCF kneels. UCF kneeled it today against Tulane to get Tulane inside of 21 in a 17 point win. Josh Heupel will still kneel it. So he doesn't have the he doesn't have that killer instinct, I guess. That's why UCF is faltering. Uh, it's uh, you mentioned it though, Bart. There, there were reasons if you're a Nebraska fan to be optimistic, even after you know a you know 35 point loss. It's that particularly like in the second half, things kind of snowballed, and that it was just you know, there was nothing Nebraska could really do. But particularly in the first half, I was surprised by how well Nebraska's offensive line was doing against that Ohio State front. They were winning a lot of those battles, and I thought that they did still did well in the second half. They just weren't crushing it, but this is still a Nebraska team that averaged 6.7 yards per play. So it was an overall pretty nice performance, or at least as good as most teams are going to be able to do or have shown an ability to do against this Ohio State team. I thought they had a good game plan. You know, yeah. the, like the – the Adrian Martinez, Luke McCaffrey, dual quarterback, dual threat sort of system came out. Look, that's going to cause some headaches for defensive coordinators. Like the fact that you've got to prepare for that and you've got to think about all the, like, I think we only had one or two actual pass attempts from Luke McCaffrey, but mm -hmm. they were both on the field for more than a dozen plays. And obviously the one that was a 47 yard run 
for McCaffrey uh, on the first drive and then the 10 yard touchdown run for Martinez. But still that's a, that's, that's something that frost Mr. Uh, Mr. Mr. Champion himself, you know, should be able to uh, get out there and call pretty well. Well, yeah, I, I mentioned that maybe Penn state will be able to take advantage of that next week. And that's something that Joel Klatt mentioned during the broadcast. Cause he said, you know, we did so many Ohio state games last year. I felt like we called every single one of their games, but he said, he remembers talking to Jeff Halfley, who's now of course at Boston college, but was Ohio state's defensive coordinator last year. And Halfley was just very, you know, forthcoming with the fact he says, listen, the way we play defense, we are very vulnerable to running quarterbacks. And that's exactly what Nebraska was doing. That was their game plan today. And I think that's probably going to be the game plan of any Anybody that can do it. We saw it with Trevor Lawrence in the bowl game last year in the playoff where the first time he kind of took off as a running quarterback, despite not doing it. Now, I don't know how many quarterbacks there are in the big 10 this year, really capable of exploiting it, but I think that will be the area that there is something to keep an eye on. Oh, oh, I got a little taste. Of I like that sound. I didn't think that was a dirt bike at first. I was like, Whoa, come on guys. This is a family podcast. I know, right? All right, so Michigan's rolling right now. I'm ready for an overreaction. Or yeah, how are we feeling about Josh Gaddis here too? I don't know if it's just because it was the last game, but and it's just, you know, long day, can't see all the games, uh, 11 a.m. kicks are, are, are a weekend away. Uh, but it feels like to me, as we sit here at 11, 11 central time, that like Michigan is the as big a storyline as there is on the day. I've got them going to the top 10 in my predictions for the new poll. I think there's going to be a massive overreaction to all the big 10 teams. I think Wisconsin jumps up a couple spots after Graham Mertz has a Russell Wilson game. I think that uh, Michigan, after doing that to Minnesota on the road, I think that they're off set for a huge adjustment. And I think that Ohio state's going to jump Georgia. I don't, I don't think that you're wrong on this. I think that, the first Big Ten weekend, the winners are going to end up getting a, b- a lot of positive bump. I mean, when was the last time Michigan's offense looked that good? I don't know. Was it – Is has it happened recently? Not not against a Big Ten team. I don't think so. I mean, only, at least – Only against, like, Rutgers at home. Yeah. They play like unranked Rutgers. opponents in the big house. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they're balanced. They run the ball well. Joe Milton looked very capable – uh, he's kind of, he's kind of tough to defend cause he can run a little bit. He's got a big arm. He might miss a couple, but he can, he, you know, he can deliver any throw on the field. Um, and they've got a very diverse group of receivers and they spread it around. You have four catches, Ronnie Bell, two catches, Blake Corum, two catches, Roman Wilson, two catches, Eric all AJ Haining had a catch. Mike Sanders still like Ben Mason had a touchdown catch. Chris Evans. Like they're all very, they're all different skill sets. They they're all over the place, uh, but they 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 did a good job. I thought of of getting the ball to them, and, and it, it it is year two of Josh Gaddis. Like they started looking better mid year last year. I mean this this might not be uh, a this, this this might be this might be real. This might be real. Yeah, no, it was. It was a very encouraging performance for Michigan in your first game of the season to be against a good Minnesota team. But I also think we do have to keep in mind Minnesota was without its starting right tackle, its starting right guard, its starting kicker, its starting punter, its starting kickoff specialist, a starting linebacker, a reserve defensive back. And I think that that certainly played a role in the game. But I will say, I don't think it really did much to affect Michigan's offense. I think the only time that the the absences were really a evident for the Michigan offense was on Charbonnet's 70 yard touchdown run on their second possession where it was just a simple handoff through the a gap and he got through it and there was literally nobody there because the Michigan defense was very confused and that's one of those areas where it's like I bet if your normal starting linebackers there that mistake's not happening because there was they, they were they were having trouble with Michigan's formation they weren't sure what to do but other than that, I mean, Michigan's offense was just, it was solid. There was nothing super spectacular about it. I thought Joe Milton played well. Uh, he was 15, 15 to 22 for 225 yards, a touchdown. He rushed for 52 yards and a touchdown. Nothing spectacular, but what really stood out to me was for a guy, you know, making his first career start, doing it on the road against a, a ranked Minnesota team, he didn't make any mistakes. 
He didn't force anything. He didn't try to take stuff that wasn't there. He was patient in the pocket when time allowed him to be and waited for his guy to come open. He didn't, you know, look for things. He didn't stare down receivers inside before the snap. This is who I'm throwing to and holding it. That I mean, like you said, it's evident in the way that he was spreading the ball around. He was going through his reads. He was going through his progressions. And when guys were open, he was making the throws. And yes, there were a couple throws he missed. Like there was one, I think it was Ronnie Bell got open deep. He split the safeties. It was a touchdown and Milton airmailed him by like 15 to 20 yards. And it's like, it's like what you said, you're going to see that from him sometimes because he's got a big arm. He doesn't have the great accuracy or touch just yet. But I thought that based on what you hear about him or thought about him, like you, you mentioned his numbers in high school and what you'd seen about him so far when he's had limited time. I think that the improvement's already pretty evident from what I saw last year, where it was just, I saw a lot of tools and now I'm starting to see this guy kind of develop a little bit. But I do think going forward that he could be, I mean, depending on how things shake out, I don't, I mean, maybe it's a low bar, but I, I, my first impression of Joe Milton is this might be the best quarterback in the Harbaugh era at Michigan. I mean, he's definitely got the, I mean, the upside is no, no doubt. Um, so yeah, I mean, he's a red shirt freshman, right? So just to, you know, if he just, just kind of develops, um, you would think he gets there. Uh, that, that, that was an encouraging debut for sure. Not so encouraging for Tanner Morgan. <laughs> and I've been a big Tanner Morgan guy. And again, he was without both his starting right tackle and his starting right guard. And he was under pressure a lot, but even when he was not under pressure, he was not accurate. He was not patient. He was just kind of staring guys down a little bit. And that's, that was the thing with him last year. It wasn't just that he had a big arm. It's that he was also very accurate throwing down the field. And he had two deep, deep throws in this game. One in the first half to Ottman Bell, which he severely underthrew him. It was kind of like a, it was a rainbow. If even that, that might be generous. I don't know if he even had that low of an arc and Ottman Bell made a great, you know, adjustment on it, came back, caught the pass. And then there was one off play action in the second half, which is something that was surprised me because he was really good off of play action last year. And I don't think Minnesota went to it nearly enough tonight, but they went off of play action. He got Rashad Bateman. And if he leads Rashad Bateman with a good throw, it's a touchdown, but he underthrows it. Bateman has to slow down. He collides with the defensive back, gets the pass interference and is able to pull the ball in any way for the reception, which was just Rashad Bateman doing Rashad Bateman things. But at the same time, it's like that could have been six and they scored later. So there was no harm, no foul, but still he, it was moments like that with him where it just wasn't there. Now it's the first game of the season, missing two of your starting offensive linemen. It's hard to think anybody's going to come out and be amazing right off the bat. So you can just write it off. Maybe it's a rusty performance for him, but it was, it was, it was a disheartening performance for Morgan. I think if, if Minnesota is going to be that team competing for the West again, especially after seeing the way freaking Graham Mertz looked on Friday night, they need Tanner Morgan to be a lot better than he looked on Saturday. If they're going to be that team again. So what was the early? I, I, I like finally got all my attention in uh, based on like sort of the way my writing day went where and uh, I'd done the uh, SEC on CBS post game show as well. But the like I saw the him sail Ibrahim on that fourth and goal mm -hmm. where he had him wide open in the back mm -hmm. of the end zone after extending the play. And like, look, short little dude, I understand that it's not like Rashad Bateman or, you know, Tyler Johnson or somebody right there. But that was a big, that was a big moment. It kind of felt yeah, like yeah. if they'd gotten a touchdown right there, then you weren't really quitting on Minnesota. You were still entertaining the idea that they were going to get back into it. Uh, so like even to that point, it had been a little inconsistent. Yeah, it was, I mean, that was just, that was kind of just another symptom or just another ev piece of evidence of how it was all night, because he was like, there was nobody open. He was rolling out to his left. He was under pressure. And then Ibrahim kind of just, you know, slipped back. He made a really smart play. He, he sensed there was nobody in the back of the end zone, and he was supposed to be blocking on the play originally, but he slipped back to the back of the end zone. And he was wide open, and you just see, like, Morgan kind of, instead of just tossing an easy pass in there for an easy touchdown because that's all he had to do, he kind of had, like, a panic reaction and threw it really hard and really high. And it's like there's, like, Ibrahim is not a big dude. You can't expect him to have a five-foot vertical to go up and get that thing. I do Graham Mertz Heisman. Well, I, I, I will say he was like, uh, look, the, as far as quarterback debuts. So Joe Milton was pretty good. Yep. Um, Graham Mertz is pretty good. Mm -hmm. uh, TJ Finley at LSU. We'll talk about LSU a little bit. is pretty good. Um, like a lot of these new faces, I think looked like the, the best case scenario. A little bit. Graham Mertz certainly did. Um, 
he was he was another one that was damn near perfect. And I've got I've got them pretty high in my rankings. And I, I think look, we we know what the defense is and the defense was it. We know the offense is gonna be able to run the ball to a degree. Uh, even if it's not John the Taylor. And if Graham Mertz is just like that efficient, who, what soccer team is scoring right now? No, it's the Rays. He's the definitely Rays. watching. Oh. The He's Rays up. just won on a walk-off. Okay. I had the Rays at plus 184 tonight, boys. <laughs> <laughs> so that's 8-7? That's a wrap? Mm-hmm. Dang. Sorry. Got ourselves a series. Another sport. Another sport that I don't follow. Um, well, hey, so, do you want to jump in on our roof principle? What's that? <laughs> no, no, chip, 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 chip. We, we're keeping that between us. We don't want that to become public knowledge, Chip. Barton, we'll tell you off the air. Okay. Just pay attention to whether the Globe Life Field roof is open or closed and then make a play on the total. And then just wake up to money. <laughs> well, okay. I mean, it's baseball, so... <laughs> All right, quarterback debuts. Anyways, I, I think with Graham Mertz, the way he played, I, I don't know that I think that's going to be him all year, but I think it was it was enough to make me think Wisconsin is the clear Big Ten. Well, I don't know. I was going to say Big Ten West favorite, but my boys down in Evanston got after it a little oh, bit. <laughs> so I'm not going to throw them out yet as a Big Ten West championship contender so yeah well those two those two oh, yeah. Listen, I mean, I, if there's it, just dog walking maryland that's what makes you a big 10 west i mean dog contender. walking illinois like they both beat the brakes <laughs> off of bad teams so like, this, what's the difference what is the difference all right so the, the difference is wisconsin's blast. wisconsin the difference yeah, was, is we saw Wisconsin throwing on first down. You know, we saw, don't we know, saw like, Wisconsin like, choosing to throw the ball on first and ten. That is new. That is something we have not seen. Like I went up, I went back and I was looking at it. And Paul Chris was the offensive coordinator for Russell Wilson in that year. And he was the offensive coordinator when Scott Tolzien looked like one of the better quarterbacks in the Big Ten. You know, those back-to-back -back Rose Bowl years were the last years before Chris ends up getting hired away to go to Pitt. And that is like where he's been hoping to get to like in all of his time leading this Wisconsin team, he's been hoping to get to a point where you do have uh, a little bit more, like not only just balance, but the ability to um, like really start to pick apart a defense with your quarterback. And with Graham Mertz, he's got it. Like that's like, I made that Russell Wilson reference earlier and I wasn't just trying to be total hyperbole. It's with the idea. And again, just totally just my idea that I've cooked up as a weird little college football fan that he just pulled that notebook out from that 2010 or 2011 season. And he's like, all right, we can do this. We, we can do this with this player. Well, and I think the other thing that was encouraging was not, not even necessarily Graham Mertz, but it seemed like they had more playmakers at receiver than, mm -hmm. You know, like they, they have the next in, pass catchers for sure. Jake Ferguson is my guy, but I think that that, that crew is, is sufficient as playmakers. So yeah, I mean, that's the key. Like you can't just expect Graham Merce to go out there and deal without someone to give it to. And, and I think those guys are, I think those guys can make some plays for him. Like going back to the, the Northwestern thing though, let's, let's not forget that Maryland last year in the big 10 went one and eight beating Rutgers 48 to seven. And yet even with that 48 to seven win was still outscored by an average score of 42 to 16 in big 10 play. So tonight was just a pretty much an average Maryland game going back to last season. No, I'm not going to let you do this. I'm not going to let you do this. The Northwestern just put up 43 points. Do you remember was, how I, bad I that Northwestern offense was last year? I know. I was. You I'm on the over no. with you with Northwestern this year. That was the best Northwestern. The offense. You, you cannot just time. brush off Northwestern. But it was Maryland. Five, but it, I, I, what they did? They what they did? They did they play Maryland last year? What no. was it? Okay. Like wh what game? Like they played a bad team last year. Like when did they? When did they approach 20 Fair points? Keys. Like, Syracuse. What, that was their that was their offense. Oh no, no, Maryland. You're asking about Northwestern. I'm asking about yeah. Northwestern. Like when did that? When did look. Northwestern like absolutely like pull out all the stops and just unload on somebody in, on offense? 
in 2019. <laughs> they did it. I think the most they scored was like 30 something points, but hold on. Let me double check. Let's see. Maryland. They had 31 against Purdue last year in the season opener or Northwestern. I'm sorry. They had 31 against Purdue. They put up 34 against Akron. They put up 34 on Nebraska. They put up 31 on Wisconsin. Oh, that's, that's actually a lot more than I remember. I'm sorry. I'm looking at 2018. Not I was going to say that. That's oh, my bad. Yeah, no, no, that I, I'm sitting there. I'm like, wait a second. That did not happen. <laughs> they put up 30 against UNLV. They put up 45 against UMass and they put up 29 against Illinois. And that is it. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm just, look, you know, like, this offense, it is worth repeating how bad this offense was. And I think Mike Pajakian is a really good offensive coordinator. And I think Peyton Ramsey is a, he's 20, what, 23 or 30. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, just, and, and he had a 50 yards rushing as well. Like, I just think um, that this is, this validates that Northwestern is legitimately a good team this year. And I, I get it. It is Maryland and they, they may, that, that, uh, but, but look, the offense was good. And if the offense is continues to just be decent throughout the year, then that's going to be a tough team to beat. Well, it's funny because I, I do think that Northwestern is a team that, you know, is probably, they might be the third best team in the West. They might be the second best team in the West. I'm not even going to rule that out, but what's funny but to me going is, to rule out the first. I, I don't think they could beat Wisconsin though. I don't. I mean, it's not like, it's not like Northwestern hasn't won a big 10 West title. It has. No, I'm not ruling it out. I'm just saying I don't think it's going to. But All right, that's fine. W- what's funny to me about the situation is because there are only 25 Northwestern fans in the world, and I know like 23 of them. And I was talking to them, you know, I just dealing with them tonight. What's hilarious is that Northwestern puts up 43 points, right? They have like what? How many? 537 yards of offense. And they're pissed. Because they've spent like the last seven years yelling at Pat Fitzgerald, telling yeah. him to fire his offensive coordinator. And Fitz was just every single time was like, nope, no, I'm not doing it. I believe in it, but we don't need to. And then he finally does it. And now they're like, see, think of what we could have been doing the last seven years if you just brought in a new offense instead of being so stubborn about it. So they're true. They win by 40 and they're pissed off. Just squandered the Clayton Thorson years. <laughs> those, those spoiled <laughs> Northwestern fans. All those, all those 30 points. Clayton Thorson could be in the Pro Bowl right now. Could have. I mean, those, are the, those, are, those are Clayton Thorson just putting them on his back. <laughs> Coming up on the other side, we will take a look at one of the big headlines, one of the bummer headlines uh, of the day, but also uh, some significant uh, notes to take away from some of the ACC championship contenders, including sweet, sweet victory for those holding that plus 46 and a half. Next. Okay. Uh, we'll start. Jalen Waddle is out for the season. Yep. That sucks. Like there is, uh, there is number one, a very like calloused reaction, which I think probably comes from uh, somebody who's not as intimately involved with the SEC or Alabama, or you know, might be like, well, whatever. Like they, they've they've got other players, and yes, they do. They Alabama has been recruiting at the wide receiver position such that you've got a John Michi the third who can step up and be able to level up his production. You still have Devonta Smith, an absolutely superb big game guy, like uh, a surgeon when it comes to route running. Mac Jones has been phenomenal. Uh, Najee Harris is, is fantastic. And then we got to see Robinson and even Trey Sanders got into the game. So the offensive weapons are, are without a doubt still there. But like Jalen Waddle, when you factor in kick returns and punt returns and just what he can do in terms of yards after the catch, that's one of the most explosive players in football, like football, NFL, college, high school, whatever. He's out of the equation right now. And that's a, that, that's a game changer for Alabama. It is a game changer that Alabama can't overcome. They can still win a national championship, even without Waddle in the lineup. But to lose him on the very first like opening kickoff of the game uh, was a little bit of a bummer. But Alabama still goes on to win 48-17 in Knoxville, yet another win against the Vols. And so, like, we're... Like, like, how was the uh, the adjustment for y'all watching Alabama, or how much did you keep track of it as the the injury clearly from the the jump became the storyline of the game? 
I, I didn't get a lot of eyes on this game. Um, I obviously got wind of the injury, um, and and that's that that sucks for Jalen. Uh, sucks for all of us because he's so fun to watch. But um, you know, one of my initial thoughts was you know as, as thinking back to all the prep and preview for the Georgia game, how critical his presence was in in sort of predicting that game and then in the game itself and that the difficulty he is as a matchup specifically for Georgia. And if Georgia is going to have a rematch with Alabama in the SEC championship game, how, how that changes with Jalen Waddell out of the lineup, uh, how that matchup and advantages start to, to shift. Um, and I think it's, I think it's pretty significant. I, I think that they'll, they'll cruise to the championship game without him, but um, a guy like that, it's, it's not, it's not getting through the regular season. That's the, the thing it's the, you know, beating the teams like Georgia Clemson and Ohio state, you know, you need all those horses for those kind of games. So um, it sucks, but uh, you know, it sucks that everyone, you know, anytime one of the great teams is not going to have all their, their best players. Um, it's uh, it's disappointing. Yeah, no, you, you hit the nail on the head there. Cause it is like, we've talked about, the, the real difference maker that we've seen a lot in the last years is at the receiver position. And Alabama just lost one of the best receivers in the country. And he's not just a receiver to them, Chip. Like you said, he contributes on special teams. He's a very important player for them. And when it does come to getting to the playoff and competing for a national title, that is likely when his absence will be the most felt because I agree with Bart. I don't think that the Waddle injury is going to keep Alabama from winning the SEC or winning the West especially. So I don't think it's a huge deal there, but it's a huge deal as far as competing for a national title. And it's just a huge deal for college football in general, because he's one of the most fun players to watch in the country. And now we're not going to be able to watch him. And, you know, now you just hope that he gets healed up and everything's fine. So he can move on and, you know, we'll see him in the NFL tearing it up there in the future too. So that's really all you can hope for at this point, but it, it sucks. And you could tell when Nick Saban was asked about it at halftime, he was still kind of shaken up about it. So it's, it's bad news all around. Slade Bolden steps up. Uh, I thought that was my, uh, and on the SEC on CBS post game show on CBS Sports HQ, where we uh, we got our Papa John's winning ingredients. You know, we're talking about the new Buffalo chicken papadilla. You know, really, you know, give, giving it out there, giving the love to uh, to all the good, the good fine sponsors of uh, the program. But the my winning ingredient was Slade Bolden. Cause this is not somebody who, when I look at the depth chart, I'm like, Oh yeah, I'm going to tell you Slade Bolden's going to be a real difference maker, but sure enough. I mean, he gets in the game, ends up getting targeted seven times, brings in six catches, has nearly a hundred yards receiving. Like you are going to have to, and, and my, my takeaway was like good on Slade Bolden for stepping up here, but this is also going to be a challenge for Steve Sarkeesian because now you've got to start thinking about your game planning and your play calling because you're just not going to overwhelm everybody. You know, like how are you going to be lining up Devonta Smith and John Michi, and how are you going to stress defenders because you kept uh, defenses just on their toes or excuse me, on their heels. Like they just had to sit back because they were so concerned about the speed and the route running that you got from that combination of Smith and Waddle. You know, that's why we saw Michi explode earlier in the season. And like now all of a sudden, you know, Slate Bones a good player. You know, he's a real good player. You know, four, three star, four star guy out of uh, Louisiana. You know. West Monroe High School. West Monroe High School. You know, he's a good player. Good player. You know, a lot of, a lot of Hunter Renfro to that guy. But uh, but he ain't, he ain't Jalen Waddle, you know. And so now I'm I think that Mac Jones is still going to be Mac Jones. But the way that that offense game plans and the way that Steve Sarkeesian calls the games, I think that's changed. And I think that's a lot more responsibility on him. They still got one of the best <clears throat> quarterbacks in college football throwing on the ball. How weird, how weird is that right now? It's just, you know, like Mac Jones had his job took by now. But everybody's like everybody's predictions. Oh, the Georgia game Every, is gonna be where Bryce Young's comes predictions. Down. Whatever. Yeah, Everybody, you know I, mean. I feel like it was Barton's prediction, whereas one of us was on here. Nope, Mac Jones. Oh, oh, come on. Who? All right. Okay. I'm sorry. You, you, I didn't realize you were the Mac Jones guy. But Mac Jones. Point being, Mac Jones has proven he is all the way legit, and like, like he's gonna, like he's gonna be 
potentially a first round draft pick at this point. Um, if he keeps this up, Mac Jones, who Mac Ooh. Jones, Ooh. I'm going to have, I'm going to have Mac Jones tattooed on my knuckles. Eventually. No, it's, I was actually kind of mad because Bryce Young came in this game late and Mac Jones wasn't able to go over 400 yards for like the fourth straight game. He finished at only 387. It's like, come on, let him get his 400 yards. And then he can put the kid in. Um, the, uh, elsewhere at the top of the rankings, Clemson, and we, we mentioned it at the T's. Clemson did not cover 46 and a half. Oh, so sad. <laughs> it's too bad. So sad. Uh, the lingering, uh, thought in my head though, actually came from the post game press conference. Did y'all catch any of, uh, Debo getting feisty? No, did Debo I, get saw feisty? The, I saw the transcript. He uh, was not happy with a little bit of question with. So uh, he does con- this every year. Doesn't he do this every year? Yes. But it's particular right now because within the uh, the Clemson and listen, like I like Anna hit me up. Tell me if I'm wrong. We'll definitely get you. Like You'll be back on the podcast. But my understanding and, and sort of just from knowing the way that that relationship has worked there are members of the Clemson media that are very Dabo friendly. Like they are very Clemson friendly. They are very pro Clemson. Uh, they are the ones who, when we were at the national championship game in new Orleans and Clemson had just beaten North Carolina in basketball for the first time ever. Very first question. It's like Ed Ogeron, Dabo Sweeney up on stage at Sunday day before the game. And somebody raises their hand. He's like, Man, how awesome was it for us to be able to just finally take down them Tar Heels in Chapel Hill for the first time ever? I mean, did you text Brad Brownell? Like, tell me. I mean, I felt so much pride. What did you feel? You know, like, <laughs> just, there is that kind of uh, built-in relationship with a certain segment of the Clemson media. And so when Dabo starts getting grilled on social matters, when he starts like this off season has brought a lot of questions up. There was the Danny Perriman uh, dropping the end bomb at practice and trying to legislate over who said what, when, and who did what about it. Like it, there has been a little bit of a, uh, our coach is under attack. Are you with us or against us within that beat? So for context, Trevor Lawrence made a comment about how the team didn't necessarily have the energy they needed. So a follow-up was asked for Dabo Sweeney about, do you think this team had the energy that they needed? And he said, energy. I thought they had enough energy to have a win like that, score that many points, win by those many points. Uh, Took great offense to the idea that Clemson did not turn in the type of performance that they wanted. I'm uh, just sitting here like, and you're right, Barton, this is just like what Dabo does. It's just kind of the, the way he rolls through his business. Sometimes he likes to uh, take some of those blows, but I don't know, man, just let Trevor speak. Clemson slip walk through that first half. That's what, that was my observation is that they did not play well in the first half of that game. And, uh, and it, I mean, it cost them the cover certainly didn't cost them the win, but cost them the cover. I get it though. Cause like, I mean, Dabo's Dabo and some people enjoy it. Some people are tired of it. And I don't think either side is wrong. Just feel how you want to feel about it. But like, if my team is bad on the day that it scores 47 points and wins by 26, just because you thought we were going to beat the shit out of the team we were playing and win by 50 points. I'd be annoyed at the question too. Like, dude, we've, we won by 26. What do you want us to do? Win by 50? Is that, is, I mean, is that really going to make any single difference to what we are as a team? Cause we've talked about it on here. Clemson doesn't need to blow anybody out. Clemson just needs to win its ACC games and win the ACC title. And then the real games start. This is just one, like a 13 game or this year, not even it's, it's like a 10 game preseason for Clemson until the real games start. That's all it is. So yeah, I, I, I I'm not saying he's right or wrong, but I, I get it. Yeah. I, I'm not, I don't have a strong opinion on this other than I, I do think like, it's okay, Dabo, to just acknowledge that it was, you know, a little bit of a lackluster first half and that you were expected to win by 46 and <laughs> it didn't. So, like, it's okay to just acknowledge that. But, no, I'm also okay with them playing the coach games. And, you know what, coach going to coach. And Dabo's going to have his, his, his one 
game every year where he's like, you know what? I think we're just supposed to win. And I just, these guys are supposed to have fun and win. And you know what? If this starts getting that serious. One point. Start, all I care about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll go coach somewhere else. Yeah, student, students try to tell my players it felt like a loss. Quote, felt like a loss. One point's all we need. Hey, Chip, you know what I'm doing right now? I'm texting Dabo to let him know that you're against him. His flip phone just buzzed by the uh, lakeside dock where he's left it for the evening. I out for that Chip Patterson, Dabo. <laughs> um, okay, so... Where uh, what what else stands out from the day? Where else y'all want? I mean, Oklahoma. Oh, you're Pope. Before we get there, uh, speaking of Clemson, uh, did Notre Dame do anything to make you believe that they can contend with Clemson? Because they just waxed Pitt, forty-five to three, like a hundred and seventy yards of offense or something for Pitt. Mm-hmm. Um. I don't know. I feel like I feel but like that was. I think Notre Dame's good, and this was the thing we we talked about on HQ. I was like, my bold prediction was like Notre Dame uh, will become a contender by beating the hell out of Pitt, and they. You got it. I got it, but but the the what led me to that was the idea like they really haven't played bad yet. Everyone's jumping on that pit, that that Louisville game as as being underwhelming, but it it was underwhelming. But they still won, and they still scored on five of seven possessions and like whatever so um or they're able, so i just wonder if you guys are believers because i do think they're good i'm not necessarily going to sit here and pound the table and say they are a contender for clemson but i think that that's the type of performance that you need to have to get people to start to consider it yeah i, I th- that is far and away the most impressed that i've been by Notre Dame this season, you know, a lot more than the game against South Florida, because as we've seen as the years going on, South Florida is just a really bad team. And Pitt had Pitt's not a great team, but Pitt had been at least defensive solid and very to very good in a lot of areas. And Notre Dame took advantage of that, took advantage of them, beat them up all day. And the one thing that happened today that stood out was there were explosive plays in the passing attack down the field because Notre Dame might not have spe- like they didn't have Kevin Austin stand. And when that first came out, like when they released the injury report, then Austin might be out for the rest of the year, which sucks. But when that first came out, that was my thinking. I was like, Oh God, if they're already struggling in the passing game, they're now they're going to be losing Austin. They're going to be in a lot of trouble, but it turns out that you don't always need really big, fast guys. If you just have really big guys. And yeah, that's just, exactly just what 250 Notre pound had. tight ends just to just, send down the field for 50 it, touchdowns. Just throw it up in the air and let the big guy reach up and grab it. And that's exactly what they did. Cause I mean, he had book averaged over 10 yards an attempt, which to me is more important than the fact that he only completed 53% of his passes. Although you would still like to see that come up, but it's just, yeah, this was, they're, they're back to being the second best team in the ACC in my book. They, they they are. They, they have an identity. They have a really strong identity. I would be – I think I would enjoy being a Notre Dame fan this season because their offensive line is awesome, their running backs are awesome, and their tight ends are just dudes, like beasts. And whatever, so you got it. So Ben Skoranek has is, is got to be your deep threat. Maybe that's not the most exciting element of your offense, but – you know what? Like you might not go undefeated. You may not win a national championship, but you're going to know what you've signed up for every weekend. And there's going to be some fun moments. There's going to be some punchy in the face sort of moments with this offense. And that's kind of a cool identity to have. Um, that's better than most. Not bad. Yeah, cause you, like oh, you're not feeling it, huh? You ACC guy. Yeah, you still like soft kinda- ass. <laughs> you, don't, you don't like that Midwest toughness coming down to your conference like this. I'm just saying you're trotting out Fort Wayne's finest and just a homeboy 6'5", 250 from Kentucky. Like, hey, look at our tight ends running down the field. Like, I just I, – I truly believe that Pitt has been, like, laying on this uh, – on this tightrope where they've just been, their defense has been carrying so much weight and statistically it had been playing so well, but you're giving up like 30 points a game. And it, that sort of disconnect between you're down to down being great, but then also the, the final scores don't seem to match your statistical profile. 
kind of tells me that you've been playing with fire a little bit. And I think that today was the dam breaking in terms of Pitt being like, all right, like this is a group that has just been trying like with everything it's got to hold this thing together. And Notre Dame was exactly the group to break it. No, I get it. And I'm not, I, I'm actually not trying to prop this one up as proof that it is some sort of, they were, still pretty good against the run. they were still pretty good against the run. I mean, Kyron Williams only held to like what three and a half yards per carry or something yeah, like no, that. Pitt's, Pitt's run defense was fine. It was just, they were getting beat up in the secondary. My, yeah. My, my point is just that look, whatever Notre Dame, whatever Notre Dame's final record is, we're going to leave this, this season being like, that was a, that was a tough ass physical offense. And when you're going to play Notre Dame, you're in for a fist fight. And I, I just, there is something about that identity that is admirable, especially when you have sort of, I mean, that's, that's just what they've sort of organically become. It's not some sort of forced issue. I mean, it's just, just who they are and they, and they've embraced it. And I just kind of like that about that team. And, and one thing I think we should point out too, because we've spent a lot of time talking about their deficiencies on offense, but defensively, there was the game against Florida state where they gave up 26 points, but that was after a long layoff after they had, you know, they had games postponed, they had players. And it was just one half. And it was just one half in their other four games. They allowed 13 points to Duke. They shut out South Florida. They allowed seven points to Louisville and they allowed three points to Pitt today. So defensively, this is also a very good team. Um, Tar Heels rolled. I don't know. Anything, anything you, you want to pick apart about that? I didn't watch a single second of that game, Chip. I'm sorry. It's just not a big deal up here in Chicago. <laughs> big 10 comes back and, uh, and Tom writes off the beloved Tar Heels. Who they're in the, they're ranked where who never heard of them. I'm watching Purdue and Iowa. I don't care. Uh, Purdue. Yep. Purdue. Let, let, let's, 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 let's go ahead and get back to my pokes. You know, I don't, don't try to don't try to sneak that by. Hoax. <laughs> still still standing. Still undefeated. Sitting at the top. Man. You know? I mean, Spencer they're... Sanders back. Had, had an interception or maybe he had a two. This is uh this is still a team that's gonna make a few mistakes, but the defense um came to play again. Iowa State had some trouble moving that football. Uh and Oklahoma State still champions. I don't know if it's his size physically or his sideline demeanor or his volatility between success and failure. But I get big Felipe Frank's energy from Spencer Sanders. He's got some of that to him. Yes. I'll, I'll, yeah, for sure. Yeah, he, he gets a little bit loose and fast at times, but I will say, I mean, this is a huge win because now, I mean, for all intents and purposes, Oklahoma state has a two game lead on anybody else in the conference because I mean, Kansas state is also four and oh, but as far as the top two teams making the Big 12 championship, the only other one loss team in the conference is Iowa State. But now Oklahoma State has that tiebreaker. So it's effectively a two game lead on third place. So unless they royally screw up down the stretch, it feels like the Pokes are going to the Big 12 championship. There were some times, though, like I'm definitely overreacting. I'm definitely picking holes in, in places where I shouldn't. But like, you know, like Dylan Stoner yelling at his teammates when they're all like upset at each other after a play didn't go well. I just, I'm, we'll, I feel like Oklahoma is still, I'm still picking Oklahoma in Bedlam. How about that? I'm not sure. I, I'm not even sure that I wouldn't pick Oklahoma in Bedlam. I, I get it. I mean, Oklahoma still has. Oklahoma is right? good, but I just, I don't, I don't know if it's got like that, like, oh, this is college football playoff. You know what I'm saying? It feels oh, like they're, sure. they're, I'm they're at the top of the pile. I don't think there's a playoff team in the big 12. I mean, Oklahoma state could sneak in uh, if they just keep on winning and just surviving, but the, I'm not, I'm not trying to put them on the same level as the big three. Um, and maybe even, you know, maybe even the four, if you want to throw Georgia in there, uh, but they're, but they're still going to, I think they're still going to win the big 12. They get Texas next week. Are they going to win that game? I think so. I'm not. Yeah, I mean, not, look, they could lose it for sure. But I, I, I do think that this is a better team than Texas. Yes. Next three weeks is a huge stretch for your folks because they get Texas next week and then it's at Kansas State and then it's the Oklahoma game. So this is I mean, this season is the next three weeks pretty much. And then, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, bring it on. Well, we want we we want it all. <laughs> 
did Tom Herman save his job by beating Baylor? Yeah. No. Not yet. They called Urban and said, sorry, no dice. <laughs> they got the W over at Baylor. I didn't watch that game, but as I said, did anyone watch it? It sounded like Dave Aranda was 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 uh, just wanted to keep those points down, you know, just just kind of gobbling up clock. Um, not a whole lot from the Texas thirty. Just 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 a defensive guy being a defensive guy. You know what? Texas only scored twenty seven points. That that is exactly what I thought because I I wasn't watching the game, but I saw everybody tweeting about you know. Baylor just punted from the Texas 30 for a touchback. So they picked up 10 yards. I was just like, that's what happens when you hire a defensive coordinator. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, is Larry Fedora going to let that happen? He's got, he just got overruled on the headset. <laughs> yeah, that had to be tough to swallow for old Larry. Um, yeah, any, anything else from the, uh, from the notebook from the day? I mean, Lock Unity, Oklahoma. Oklahoma looked good. Oklahoma Spencer, I mean Spencer Rattler is um man when he's when he's dealing, he's looking good. And and Marvin Mims, their true freshman, uh, was fantastic. So that's that's pretty critical. I mean, that's pretty huge if Marvin Mims can keep on developing into that you know, elite outside guy for them, because that's one of the things that has has created a little bit of doubt early in the season with Oklahoma, is just feeling like there's not quite as many future first rounders. Or, or, or at least there's not that main guy. Um, and, hey, Marvin Mims sort of looked like a main guy today. I feel very conflicted about the fact that 13 for 22 doesn't necessarily always wow me when I'm looking at a box score. Was that Spencer, what, was that Spencer Rattler? But when it's for 332 yeah. yards yeah. He was and you're doing yeah. 25 yards per completion. Yeah. And a lot of those were air. Like, I don't have the advanced stats here, but this was not like dinking and dunking all the way. Like those were a lot of air yards on the way to 332. No, he was yeah. pulling the trigger on some bombs. <laughs> yeah, there, was, there was a lot of go big or go home in Oklahoma's offense today. But, I mean, T.J. Pledger ends up uh, with 122 rushing yards. That was something that was very encouraging. And, like, I, I tell you that I didn't get the full eyes on it to the point that I can say this confidently, but at least, like, you know, following the beat writers and, and trying to judge from what I could glean from the, the times that I dipped in on it. You know, like, maybe a good Oklahoma defense performance right? Maybe. I mean, some of it might be TCU's own issues as it tries to, uh, as it tries to work through, uh, some things, but, uh, you know, not a great performance for the frogs who now fall to one and three on the season, but like you're coming out of it and you're like, Oklahoma might, might win the big 12. Yeah, and regardless of whether it was Oklahoma or TCU, the fact is, for confidence, that's a good performance. So holding TCU to 14 points, whether you know you deserve the lion's share of the credit for it, or if TCU is just playing poorly, if you're on that defense and you're just looking for something because that has been you know your problem, it's just coming out of that saying, "Hey, look, man, it only allowed 14 points. We can do it. We could do it going forward. It's possible. We've done it before." So I think that's that's a big thing just for the confidence. I I want to go back, and I want to. St- bring up about how we were all blessed to be uh, in the presence of Auburn Jesus yet one more time. Oh my God. I mean, like at, at some point, like there's like a conspiracy nut out there who's you're starting to look at and you know what, you know, he has a point. <laughs> Cause like, how many times is Auburn going to get away with something like that this year? So they're playing LSU uh, in the SEC on CBS game of the week next week. And I, I'm ready to take LSU right now. LSU <laughs> kind of looks like they got their mojo back a little bit. Yeah. But listen, I'm just telling you that mojo, like whatever is like, whatever is left at Auburn, it's got to be out. Like that is, that is pulling into the gas station when you only got there because it was a downhill to get there. <laughs> like, <laughs> like that, There is no way after Arkansas and after Ole Miss that Auburn's going to be able to have enough juice left uh, on that luck mojo, Auburn Jesus, horseshoe up Gus's keister, like whatever you want to, whatever you want to point to. Like, I, I really think that uh, it's got to come to an end because 
offensively, they are just such a like Tank Bigsby runs the ball well. That's awesome, but you did it against Ole Miss. Like, there's no downfield passing attack. Bo Nix doesn't look very good defensively. Yes, they were down, and from a personnel perspective, but I was looking at the stats going into this game. Like Auburn's not elite defensively this year. They are very middle of the conference in most uh, statistical categories. Like again, you you kind of do this like brain thing. You're like, oh yeah, Auburn, but they've got a tough defense. And, and they can figure it out on offense, but I, I don't think they're that great. And to emerge with the win here against Ole Miss, man, it got to feel like it's going to swing the other way. I mean, Auburn is a football team that is what? It's three and two. Yeah, it is. It's three and two. It could easily be one and four. That's <laughs> just the and, way the team has gone so far. So uh, with, uh, well, yeah, and and not, but like even the so you're saying the one game is the Kentucky game, right? Yeah, it's, yeah, and they could even, be zero and five. Even yeah. that game was like it wasn't like it was not it was closer than the score appeared until right before halftime when that like if Kentucky scores a, a touchdown instead yeah. of there was Auburn Auburn Jesus was there too <laughs> Auburn Jesus was Auburn Jesus was there for that one, uh, yeah, uh, for sure. Um, and, and I'll tell you another, did you guys, I assume you didn't because there was a lot of games going on at the time. And this is a little bit of a back, you know, back of the sports section game relative to the contenders, but did y'all watch Missouri, Kentucky at all? No, I, I watched it because I saw stats like on Twitter about Kentucky's offense. So I flipped to it, like gazing at a car wreck. Yeah. Okay. Let, let me, let me, so I don't think you've heard these statistics. This is, this is mind blowing to me. Wait, was it Barton or Tom who texted? They need to find another wide receiver. That was, that was me. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that's, a, that's probably true. Uh, total plays. Uh, Missouri ran 92 offensive plays. Kentucky 36. Alpha nerd. <laughs> 43 minutes time of possession to 1650. I mean, yeah. Alpha nerd just stuffed Mark Stoops in the trash can. <laughs> like he's like Mark Stoops is coming out of the dumpster right now with like banana peels on his head being like, damn alpha nerd kind of is a little bit stronger than I thought. Uh, so I, I mean, I think that's a, that's encouraging sign for LSU. I mean, look, LSU's defense was a mess. Anyways, but they're starting to figure it out a little bit, and Missouri may not be that bad. I mean, no, I mean, take, let, me, let me rephrase that. Missouri may be pretty good, um, and yet, what the hell is Kentucky even at this point? Like, what, yeah. what, what is this team? Let's let's look at Kentucky's quarterback situation. 145 today. total yards, by the way. 145 yeah, yeah. total yards. Kentucky quarterbacks today: Terry Wilson and Joy Gatewood, a combined four of thirteen for forty-seven yards and a touchdown. But you say, hey, you know what? They're running QBs. You know, they're not going to put up great passing numbers. So what did they do? What did they do in the ground? Well, I'm glad you asked because Joey Gatewood and Terry Wilson combined for four yards on eight carries. <laughs> like you might as well. Like you, you were joking. I think when you were like, they need to find another quarterback to play receiver, to, wide receiver to play quarterback, but they might as well. It can't be any worse. It worked. That. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And this is not working because even if we go back to what happened last week with the win over Tennessee, they're not winning that game without two pick sixes. Like the defense had nine interceptions over the previous two games and completely shut down Tennessee and Mississippi state. It's not like the offense was playing well in those games. They just, and the offense continued to play poorly today and it ran into the alpha nerd who was at least capable of putting up 20 points on them. Just insane. Texas tech took down West Virginia. I knew Texas Tech was going to get a win somewhere along the way. That, 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 I think it's. I think Texas Tech is capable of beating a lot of teams in the Big Twelve. Um, I'm kind of surprised it's taken them this long. Fork in the road. Was this where the Neil Brown honeymoon was over for the 2020 season? You're feeling real good about yourself with three and one start. I don't. I just uh, think. I just think. I just think they're all toss ups in the Big Twelve. Yeah. I mean, just like they just like they are in a lot of these conferences. Frankly, I mean. I just think it's I, I, Neil Brown's still going to get somebody else somewhere along the way. No yeah. team deserves to be favored because I, I was looking for uh, the, and, and this didn't happen in a 34 to 27 loss to uh, Texas tech, but you know, we were talking about like, Oh, Oklahoma state, West Virginia, 
they got these sick defense numbers. And then you'll go like, yeah, y'all played Kansas. <laughs> Like, you know who else has sick defense numbers now? Kansas State after beating <laughs> Kansas 55 to 14. Like all of your margins and all of your averages look awesome after you play Kansas. Did you see the end of the first half in the Kansas Kansas State? It was like uh Kansas had the ball, was sort of trying to move the ball. I can't remember if they're trying to run the I, I think they're trying to move the ball a little bit, kind of one of those half ass deals. And then they, uh, uh, you know, they got to stop um, five seconds left. And they did the deal where Kansas State calls the timeout. Like, what the hell? Might as well. We'll call a timeout, make them punt, just see if they screw it up. And they punted oh, it away. Yes. And the dude returns the punt for a touchdown. He returned two punts for touchdowns on the day. Like, that's how things are going with, uh, with Kansas. Yeah, that was the uh, like on like what somebody else's sponsored segment was like surprise performance of the day. <laughs> it's like surprise performance of the day. Whoever has special teams against Kansas gets touchdowns. <laughs> it's not a surprise, bro. You know, it was a special day when like you score 55 points despite only having 381 yards of offense. <laughs> they lost they lost two possessions just scoring scoring touchdowns other ways. Mm -hmm. Common theme today on Saturday. Just low yardage totals, a lot of points. Funny how that happens. Uh, all right. Anything else before we get out of here? Do we want to talk LSU? I didn't see it. I mean, so TJ Finley actually looks pretty decent. Yeah. Um, Max Johnson, the other freshman that we expected to play, didn't even get in. And like I said, I think – I think LSU is starting to starting to get in the, starting to get in the groove. Terrace Marshall was I, I mean looked like he got a lot of touches. Six catches, 88 yards, two touchdowns. Ty Price Davis, 135 yards rushing and TJ Finley, 17-21, 265, two touchdowns, an interception. He also rushed for 24 yards of the touchdown. Well, he's, he's very Joe Miltonish. Man, we we might have seen the end of Miles Brennan. No, nah, Ed O said he said right. Just don't even talk about it. No quarterback controversy. Miles is in when he gets back. That's what that's 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 according to Big Coach O. Uh, did y'all sell all your Virginia Tech stock? I want to. I didn't see enough of that game to make a an educated decision. Is Virginia Tech like this year's pit? Like, is it just, is that is that just the team that just doesn't make any sense? Because they seem to not make any sense. No, they know who they are. And I guess in that way, they are kind of like Pitt, but um, I'm just, I'm just saying like Pitt in the sense of like, you don't know what's going to, like, there's no telling whether they're going to blow someone out or lose just in, in some sort of in like, you just don't know what they are. If they played like dumbasses today against Wake Forest against smart asses. I mean, they, they went in there and they had tons of awful penalties. Like it was, it was a very, very poorly played game from an execution standpoint in a lot of dumbass ways and Wake Forest took advantage. I mean, that was, that was a very Dave Clawson win for Wake Forest today to be able to just outsmart Virginia tech on your own home turf. Yeah. Dave Clawson's a wily, he's a wily yeah. dude. Um, Louisville put Florida State right back, right back in their place. Just kicked them down the stairs again. I Danny mean, was, you're asking. Danny was quiet in the group check with that one for a while. <laughs> oh, I cannot wait for Knowles to go on Monday. <laughs> Miami was kind of ass. Yeah, <laughs> I thought, you know I thought about playing that one in the in the locks just because like we all said last week was Miami's or I did I think that, that was the pick game right that that was their their hangover game, but you know the hangover of the hangover <laughs> can some be sometimes be pretty tough too. Like I'm getting old. Sometimes it takes me two two days to get over a bad hangover. Uh, Virginia on a rainy night. That's that's uh that's raking that's raking some leaves too with a bad hangover that's so that, that was not i wasn't surprised to see that especially because brendan armstrong was back at mm -hmm. least for um so virginia found a way to make that ugly and nasty and and, and kept it close but 
Uh, Miami figured out a way. And, hey, look, I'm going to give them credit for that. They, I, I still think that they're, they're winning some games that they typically lose right now. So yeah. props, props to you guys figuring it out. We'll admit, because I was having a rough start to the day with the morning and afternoon slate, I did chase a little bit with the under in this game, and that came through for me. So I'm happy for that to happen. Miami, just one of my most reliable under teams. I appreciate that about them. As long as we're confessing things, I ended up going uh, on the opposite side of y'all's Minnesota pick and yeah. played Michigan today. And that's that saved me some money. Just Walton, <laughs> just yeah. like walking around the house with the chest puffed out a little bit. It was, it was actually a, it was, it was a, I was below 500 on the day. As soon, the yeah, as, part. as soon as I found out everybody that Minnesota was missing, I was, I, I almost pulled the trigger on Michigan myself at that point, but then I didn't want to be rooting against my own lock. The, I, I will say that my, overreaction I think is one of the most fun overreactions that I could have. And it's that the dirt bike offense might be really fun and that Joe Milton might not be like a total liability and where we've talked about so many quarterbacks in college football this year who you're like, well, I just hope that that offense can survive in spite of them. It's like, all right, you check some boxes today. So Michigan being really good and like that Michigan Penn state game, you know, what'd we say? Penn state and Ann Arbor ain't, it, ain't exactly uh, the kind of, the kind of spot that shows up. If all of a sudden we're looking at Ohio state, Michigan as being a, uh, a game for the big 10 East, that'd be pretty exciting. I would take that. I'd sign up for that. Uh, Josh Gaddis will be motivated for that one. Yeah. Franklin Franklin promoted Ricky Ronnie as OC instead of Gaddis. Gaddis pieced out to Alabama. Was Gaddis at Vanderbilt too? Mm-hmm. Mm. Mm. This one's personal. How many beefs does Josh Gaddis have? I don't. I don't know. That's a piece. <laughs> he's got. Not, he's got <laughs> Maryland. He definitely has Maryland, right? Because he's definitely got Mike Loxley. I mean, they went out. They were straight up public with that one. Like, yeah, they were just like calling each other out in the media. I don't. I, I. I honestly have no idea. I. I'm, I don't really know if there's hard feelings between Gaddis and, and Franklin. I. But. I, but like it is. That is true. That when, when Joe Moore had left, Gaddis and Ronnie were both on staff, and Ronnie got the OC job. Gaddis didn't. So, um, I just. I think he may have a little uh, Jeff Halfley uh, index card in his wallet. You know, names he's got to cross off. People <laughs> that doubted him. Just and chips, chips on Halfley. <laughs> chip, chip is on Halfley's card and just got crossed off like <laughs> hell today. I got, I got called out on Twitter, and I hope you're listening. Uh, I'm not gonna pull pull it up right now, but uh, yeah, I, I said that Boston College was gonna turn into a pumpkin. If you're watching on YouTube, YouTube.com/slash Cover Three, I was wrong. Boston College did not turn into a pumpkin. That team is a legit top half of the ACC team in 2020. He has done a, a fantastic job. And I thought that Boston College's performance today was uh, V impressive. Kiss ass. I, I think Jeff Hafley is, is one of on the short list of coach of the year type guys. No, he's doing a very good job yeah. in a very short amount of time. Yeah, without a doubt. He is Tom Fernelli. You can follow him on Twitter at Tom Fernelli. You can follow him on Twitter at you can follow him on Twitter at Barton Simmons. You can follow me at Chip underscore Patterson. Virginia Tech is a Kentucky ass team too. What are they? Signed Matt Coca. So I just saw that. <laughs> Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, the Cover Three Podcast. We are on Apple Podcasts. We are on Google. We are on Spotify. We are on Stitcher. Please subscribe on YouTube. YouTube.com slash Cover Three for that multi-platform excellence, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank you.